Is this a remake of The Exorcist? Why did they keep the weird archaeological dig at the beginning? Also, seriously, this opening sequence makes it look like the gem itself will be a super important factor in this movie. Like it's gonna have actual supernatural abilities or dance around when faced with positive emotions like the pink goo in Ghostbusters 2, but much like all that shit Howard sells in his store and the hype over this movie, it's a big fugazi. <laughs> Weirdly enough, this is the quietest part of the movie. Dude has a headlamp and his buddy next to him with his headlamp and his flashlight. Is the giant hand torch in the mouth really a necessity right now? 2001, a gem odyssey. Sometimes when you get on Pornhub, you want to see close-ups, but sometimes your curiosity takes you too far. Yep, that's right, ladies and gentlemen, this movie just took you on a path through the inside of Adam Sandler's ass right at the beginning, but we're sinning it mostly because at no point did we see the head of Rob Schneider. If this is going to be a sequel to Funny People, I'm out. Dude, even if the movie is saying Howard is impervious to the after effects of the anesthesia for the colonoscopy, he'd at least be walking a little gingerly right now. Well, Lakeith Stanfield gets second credit in a prestige film. Oh yeah, I forgot his character is super marginalized and borderline forgotten by the end. This guy slaps Adam Sandler for bringing him a water when he said he didn't want one. I sure hope Sandler learns his lesson and doesn't lock this guy in a hot room later in the movie. I know that sounds like a really specific situation, and it's a 1,001 shot and it'll never happen, but trust me, you shouldn't trap this guy in a hot room. Come on, come on, it's not a soap opera. I agree, considering how scuzzy and chaotic this movie is, I'd call it the opposite of a soap opera. Like, this is a grunge opera. It should have been scored by, like, an Alice in Chains album from 1992. Okay, what the hell is this scene? Is Howard's girlfriend operating a brothel out of here? Was it just a dope party that went all night? Is the movie interested in telling us anything about Julie's character other than the fact that she's completely and perplexingly infatuated with Howard? No! 10.30. It's time to wake up. In Julia's defense, she's fully awake. Might be in bed still, but her ass is awake. And I mean that literally. Can we all agree as a society that using the word extra like this will be outdated in five years or so? 20 year olds are going to be using this term in 2025 and kids are going to think they're 50. It's this guy, The weekend. What the f*** is The weekend? Gonna... I don't know for sure, but if Loverboy taught me anything, and they have, everybody's working for him. Turn around! Mike Francesca. You gotta shut that door. It's KG, huh? That close? Door shadowing. No one will be seated during the Howard shows Kevin Garnett a blinged out Mogwai part of the movie. And Kevin was just telling me he looking for some watches. Right. That, uh, that you one know what you got that crazy ass deal for? That one for 16. I know Howard is just happy to get KG in the store, but what was he thinking about selling to Garnett? What does he have in the inventory that he's highlighted besides the Furby how is he even keeping the showroom afloat? What happened? Come. Your street goons in there, they attacked me, man. Okay, this movie is packed to the gills with anxiety. You've got Kevin Garnett outside looking to make a purchase, but he's also flirting with Howard's girlfriend. You've got Lakeith Stanfield pressuring him about the watches that he wants Howard to sell for him. Then an important and probably illegal package arrives, and this guy is complaining about the goons who came to the store and roughed him up. If I wanted to be anxious during a movie, I'd watch Basic Instinct with my mom on her birthday. Well, what did you say to piss them off? Listen, Garnett's crew came in here, they took a look around, they see these guys they're like yo who works you who doesn't who doesn't get out i said these guys don't work here well, that was stupid you shouldn't have said that these i've watched this scene four times now and all i hear is shouty shouty shout yell yell holla shout yell which is the entire tone of this movie of all the ways to ship this rock why'd they choose the inside of a fish i'm sure they're trying to hide it and everything but why a fish are they sending a sicilian message or something holy i'm gonna come what, does this rock have a script inside where you get to film in Hawaii again? Howard is able to pull up the exact History Channel video he needs for the visual aid to his story in no time. And it doesn't even appear to be a YouTube video. He's got this immediate access via random phone in 2012? It took me 17 months to get this thing. Oh, but Howard just said... I'm watching TV like a, a year ago. Why would he estimate on the ideology of the plan and then get super specific about how long it took him to get the actual stone? This is old school, Middle Earth You know the problem with this movie? The talking. Every character says the same thing in a slightly different way over and over and over again. And sure, that may be how people talk in the real world, especially in these circles. But it doesn't mean I want to spend over two hours watching that shit on screen. How are we doing this again? You already tricked me into looking at the inside of Adam Sandler's ass earlier. If this time we end up inside the ass of John Lovitz, well, I'm swearing off movies forever. Also, don't you hate it when you have a transcendental experience when looking into a rock and it shows you a slideshow of your achievements right alongside the suffering of the Ethiopian people? That's not for sale. I can't, I can't sell it. What a f rock tease. What a f would you show me something if I couldn't have it then? KG may be an evil 
talking basketball player, but he would be excellent at cinema sins. Howard takes a half ass selfie where he's barely in the frame when there are like 10 people in this room that could have taken the picture for him. Of all the stupid shit he does in this movie, this is probably the worst. Talking on a speakerphone in public. It's Kevin Garnett's 2008 championship ring. Nonsense. Everyone knows that no Boston sports team has won anything in like 100 years. <laughs> if they did, could you imagine how insufferable they would be? I'm going to give you $25,000, but I want an 8% VIG on the ring. Even if I could understand what's being said as these characters are talking over each other, only a f degenerate gambler would have a clue what the hell a VIG is. Look, I understand he has a lot of money on this, but this is the beginning of an NBA game. It's possible the beginning of an NBA game is more boring than a middle school soccer match. If this were the fourth quarter, I might give a sh about whether he's going to win his bet. But he's getting animated over the most inconsequential part of the game right now. Stuff that won't make or break his wager. We didn't even get to see if the Celtics won the opening tip, which is part of the parlay. I mean, of course I looked it up and found out that they did, but it's a sin regardless. <laughs> You. Yes! Hey, you know this guy? The guy that overreacts to every play during a game, whether it's because of a bet or fandom or whatever? Yeah, that guy is the f worst, right? Well, welcome to this movie's idea of a protagonist. You, sleep. you know, for a guy that's obsessed with this game, Howard sure is leaving all opportunities to watch it. Hell, he could have watched the whole thing on his phone in Benny's room or finished that sh out with Eddie in his room. None of this matters because he's going to find out that Eric Bogosian stopped the bet. Anyway, part of the parlay that Howard gave the bookie was Kevin Garnett blocked shots. Since this is based on a real game, we can see that Howard got the Celtics to cover. Celtics halftime, Garnett points and rebounds, and the Celtics opening tip. But the one he did not get was the blocked shot one. Kevin Garnett didn't get a single block in that game. The only way he won this bet is if he bet against Kevin Garnett, and that was not the spirit of this bet at all. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. Well, he did say he was gonna come. I just didn't think it would take him this long. And in a cab, no less. Closet sexting. Closet sexting? <laughs> Dude, if you're gonna try and be sneaky about this weird approach, can't you turn your phone to silent? How does she not hear this? I just hit so Big. Premature celebration. And given the way his girlfriend is dressed, along with Howard's advanced age, I'm gonna throw in premature ejaculation just for good measure. Also, I maybe understand Howard not calling his bookie right away, since it's late, but he goes an entire f day without checking with Gary on a huge bet that he actually hit. You don't think a money hungry f like Howard wouldn't be at the restaurant early in the morning to collect? <laughs> oh, this is the last straw. Get out of here. You haven't been returning my phone calls? He's Guys, man, who are they? What do they mean to the overall story, except to remind us that Howard's into it with a few more people? All it does is make me want to listen to a Paul Simon album. Oh, Garnett got it. All right, Garnett's got it. Well, why did Damani even bother meeting up with Howard if he didn't have the opal with him? Maybe he was afraid to tell Howard about it because Howard is a douchebag, but nothing about their relationship so far has shown that Damani is scared of him whatsoever. Can't call him right now. He's in practice. Does Damani really know the daily habits of Kevin Garnett this well? And even if he does, why are they practicing at nine in the morning, the day after a? F night game. What kind of sadistic coach is Doc Rivers? Howard text bombs Damani because Howard is a loathsome asshole, but some of the texts he sent, Damani. I mean, that's just his name. And listen? Listen to what? Why do those require their own unique texts? This is a waste of a text bombing, man. He's bought tickets to a high school play just so they could keep an eye on Howard? Why wouldn't they just be outside waiting by his car or something? Or did they really want to see a high school production of the three little men in the wood that badly? After Howard pushes Phil into the lockers and the other guy grabs him, Phil has a clear-cut path to beating the out of Howard if he wants to, but Phil allows him to bite the other guy and get away somehow. I told you how things were gonna go if you didn't start to behave. Sure, and Arno has every right to teach this asshole a lesson, but why pull this at his daughter's play? It's not like Arno is a seasoned thug who wants to make a statement. He's part of the goddamn family. Why not hit him at the shop or the love nest or while he's on the street? Never you think you're like a I don't know who said that! Adam Sandler does put in a fantastic performance in this movie, but there are times when he's shouting where it comes dangerously close to sounding like Bobby Boucher. Congratulations, Otto! You f***ed us! There's so much anxiety in this movie that they had to change the title of Mel Brooks' High Anxiety to Dead Calm, and Dead Calm had to change its name to Being in Nothingness. You know, Adina Menzel didn't have much to work with besides a shrewish housewife who's sick of her husband's but she kills this performance. This look tells it all. Disgust, pity, remorse, fury, and I've seen this before all rolled into one. I'm gonna remove a sin for the one character that I actually root for in this movie. Hark! Who goes there? Place. I go into a locker room with your silly ass, it makes me look really suspect. Seems like sorry to bother you could have said that in the first place. It didn't require a drive all the way to Philadelphia and ghosting him to get that message across. Just, I was very proud of you tonight. You were beyond incredible. Yeah, you told me like five times already. Kids. 
So Howard sees Julia at the show and starts to get jealous. But did he know she was going to be here? Were they supposed to come together? What the f*** would Howard be doing at a weekend show all by himself anyway? Why is this sequence? Way too many minutes of the weekend performance. I swear to God, if the movie just showed the movie, it would be at least 30 minutes shorter. I said no touching. Julia sells some drugs to the weekend, who's famously anti-drug, by the way. So is she a dealer? A part-time hooker, madam? Does anyone have any defining characteristics in this f***ing movie? Look, I understand that this movie is trying to make us believe that this woman really loves Howard. It doesn't make sense but whatever. But did we really need to see her entire 45 second walk back past the club? Then we see 31 seconds of Howard walking after that, followed by an entire minute of him finding a pillow to sleep at the office overnight. Something we could have figured out if the movie had just cut to him waking up in his pink shirt from the night before. This movie has a lot of merits, but the runtime is blown up by scenes like this. Furthermore, I could see that the movie maybe wanted to give you a chance to rest before Howard gets into possibly one of the most anxious scenes of the movie, but it's been relentless so far, why stop now? This scene here, I don't know whether to remove sins or give it a ton of sins. It sets up a scenario that is so riddled with anxiety that it should come with Xanax for anyone who watches it. It accomplishes exactly what it wants to do, but much like Avery Bradley in that NBA game we saw earlier, it is pointless. Everybody ends up getting in the store and Kevin Garnett ends up giving him back the stone, even though Howard can't give KG his ring back. The doctor calls Howard about his colonoscopy, but the results are clean. The only thing that happens is Damani pours vitamin water into a fish tank. It's the only consequence of this madness. I just offered you a quarter of a million dollars for a Rock, right. dummy. Actually, he offered $175,000 in cash. Sure, he mentioned the four courtside seats, but that really doesn't matter, considering Howard lives in New York and Garnett's gonna be traded next year anyway. Where, where yeah. my yeah. at? I'm no safe expert, but shouldn't this be a little harder to open? Go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, man, this is Howard. Only a real asshole would put his GI doctor on speakerphone at this point to talk about his real asshole. Hey, remember one of the many people who had problems with Howard earlier in the movie? The guy who quit during one of those super anxious scenes? Yeah, I don't either. Is this scale with its bonkers number output supposed to represent something? That Howard is losing his soul? If Sean Penn taught me anything, that f only is supposed to weigh 21 grams. And that's less than half a pound, so this metaphor is a lie. This is a KG, huh? Damn, how did it get to the last 15 seconds of this game already? Just a minute ago, there was 541 left. And I know that no extra time has passed because these two guys have been talking uninterrupted about the Knicks the whole time. It's, it's uh, anywhere from $1,000 to $3,000 a carrot, and it's 600 carats. Oh! I know Howard runs his mouth and all, but why does he keep doing this in front of Arno, whom he knows is the most dangerous enemy he could make right now? This is like Beavis and Butthead levels of stupidity. <laughs> I don't doubt that Adina Menzel is in terrific shape, but if she's the exact same size she was at 12 years old, there are many anatomy and developmental problems here. And later she says she was overweight as a kid, but ain't no way that dress would fit an overweight kid. Your face is so stupid. Feedback from test audiences during the lead up to Little Nicky somehow makes it into this script. Directors of Good Time insert the male lead of Good Times into this movie, but only give him a cameo as neighbor 33F. I feel like John Amos deserves better. It's at this point that Julius set Madonna's reign to be played when Howard walks in, and I can't help but think a better and similarly random option would be Millie Vanilli's Blame It on the Rain, or Guns N' Roses' November Rain, or even Nelson's After the Rain. Hell, even Rihanna's umbrella would be more appropriate. This is a great scene where Howard takes out the trash and the recycling. What's hard to figure out in this scenario is where do you put the grown-ups to? It seems like trash, but it is also recycling. Is there a hotline you can call to find out? No, get her out of the meeting. It's an emergency. I want to speak with her. Call her on the phone, please. Thank you. This works. Seriously, who wouldn't boot Howard's ass out of this lobby right now? Well, Oscar's wrong. It usually is. As difficult a character this is to play, where nobody is going to like you, Adam Sandler definitely deserved an Oscar nomination. That sounds like I should take a sin off for his performance, doesn't it? Okay, I'll do it. We can either pull it or carry on as is. It's Tilda Swinton is not pictured in this scene. Seriously, what gives? Was she off filming another weird-ass Jim Jarmusch movie and couldn't be available to show up on set? I want my Tilda. Try 160. 160 now. Dude, I know KG is interested in this gem, but he's spending a lot of time in New York City during a playoff series between Boston and Philadelphia. I think even Phil Jackson would tell Dennis Rodman he needs to get back to the team facilities at this point. Hello? No one on the phone. Eric Benosian. Weren't these guys going to rough Howard up even more than this? They couldn't wait until they got somewhere private to give him a serious beating. I know that Arno is protecting Howard from getting killed, but he took a worse beating during the high school play part of the movie. You're my home. You could come to me. To each their own. But I really don't understand why Julia is in love with Howard. He's like 25 years older than her, is an awful person, doesn't have any money, and owes gangsters. He's terrible. He treats her like <laughs> He's an awful person, and he sucks. She can get a Kevin Garnett or a weekend, and she's pining for this schlub. Even getting a tattoo of his name on her ass. Jesus. Everything I do is not going right. Everything I do is not going right. <laughs> hey, big guy, settle down. Jack and Jill was a piece of shit. But you did do Punch Drunk Love, showing proof that you do have some taste, even though you seem to frequently ignore it. 
Do not let him in. Understand me? You know, the real poetic justice in this movie would have been one of these unimportant characters being one of the people who end up killing Howard over a debt. But there are at least two red herrings in this movie that are basically just here to give the Safdie brothers some more anxious moments to jerk off to. Paid a hundred grand, okay? So you doubled your money. For 165000 I don't want to cast aspersions, but that sounds like the new math they teach you in the NBA instead of college. And I'm not a athlete. This is my way. This is how I win. You mean having inside knowledge of the team you're betting on? Sounds like Pete Rose circa 1987. I guess this is a statement on the fact that NBA players bet on themselves and influence outcomes based on gambling odds. And the fact that Garnett is in this movie validates that. So explain to me why I'm supposed to be excited for the lead to come back later this summer. Okay, KG, I need you to give me your this is f***ed up face. Really leaning into it. There you go. That's what I'm talking about. I mean, Adam Sandler and the Safdie brothers must have studied Worm and Rounders for this character. He is so goddamn infuriating. And this is what the movie wants him to be. F everything you expect from protagonists. Is there anything redeeming about him? This movie really puts us in a bind because the intent and the execution is there, but it can be very hard to watch at times. Oh! This is when ADR goes too far. Play it again. Oh! You see? Was that necessary? Again! Oh! <laughs> this is totally the sound I'm going to make the next time Chris or Barrett asks me for a narration redo. She's a Mohegan Sun. She's at Mohegan Sun or going to Mohegan Sun? Because there's no way she's at Mohegan Sun right now. She just left. Why would all these assholes leave? Do they all need to go to the casino to track Julia down? She's got so much of a head start that by the time they get there, she definitely would have already made the bet. So what do they do then? And why wouldn't someone stay with Howard? The ending of this movie is intense, for sure, but it's also built off one big-ass contrivance. Man, Phil must really be in a hurry to get trapped inside this stupid room. Close the door. Does he care if the door gets closed now or in three seconds? Why does Howard need these guys to stay here while the game is going on? Why can't he just win the bet and pay Arno later? Why do they have to be here? It works great for your shocking finale, but it does terrible things to logic. And yes, Howard is not a logical person, but I'm sinning it anyway. I have nobody to spend it with, nobody to enjoy my life with anymore. It's horrible. Who the is this guy? I guess he turns out to be okay, but do we really need an extra scuzzy character thrown into the end of this extra scuzzy movie? Hey, on this. This is exactly the way the audience feels at this point watching the movie, and that is not a good thing. A bunch of footage of a game in which any casual NBA fan will know the outcome, yet it's somehow used as a device of suspense. Okay, I bet on, um, I bet on the Celtics, specifically Kevin Garnett. Okay, two good bets. Celtics are winning, and Garnett's got nine and seven. Julia tells this random dude what she bet on Kevin Garnett, which could mean anything, but he seems to know that the bet is points and rebounds because he indicates as such during his mansplaining. It's funny that during this halftime speech, Doc Rivers is telling everyone to look at KG while he examines the Black Opal. Everyone remembers all the stories after this game where Kevin Garnett's teammates were like, KG was looking at this weird Ethiopian rock and he got power from it. It inspired us to go out there and whip the 76ers once and for all. It won't help against the Miami Heat later, but man, was this ever a special night. Howard's character is such that he doesn't recognize the temperature of people around him, so he's gonna let two psychopaths back into the room because he thinks he's safe now. It's a fitting end to his character. He dies happy because it would have been all downhill from here. There's no way this guy could make $1.2 million hold up. At first I hated this because it was stupid for him to let these guys back in, but now I understand that everything fits perfectly. Thank God, I'm sorry, but I haven't been this happy to see a movie character get shot in the face since Virgil Salazzo and The Godfather. Amy, he was naked and drunk, okay? I'm, I'm calling the police. Uh, I guess Amy is describing Howard as naked and drunk and is referring to the night of the high school play, but why is calling the police on her mind right now? Oh, fun. We get to take a trip through a bullet wound at the end of the picture. It's like the asshole of Howard's face. Also, a full minute of bullet wound traveling. Man, you must be out of your fucking mind if you think I'm gonna get in this dirty ass trunk. If you're feeling like you need to pick me up after watching Adam Sandler hustle his way through uncut gems, let us introduce you to the soothing balm that is Mubi. We're all together right now. We're all so comfortable. Mubi is a curated streaming service that will take you through a journey that'll get you super excited for cinema. Holy sh! I'm gonna come. Well, maybe not that excited, but it's pretty f***ing great. Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> oh my god! And there's exciting news. Beyond adding a new film every day to their curated lineup, Mubi has gone bonkers and launched a whole library. It's a new section allowing members to revisit and discover hundreds of films that have previously been handpicked by their curators. And it is available to Mubi members at no additional cost. It's awesome. I wish I could choose you. Every film on the platform, including the library, will have Mubi's take, explaining why they chose the film and why it's worth your time. I'm telling you, this is a cinematic streaming service like 
no other. I've been telling you. That's why I wanted you to see it. And you can totally join in on the excitement. Try a movie free for 30 days at movie.com slash cinemasins. Yeah. No. Yep, seriously. That's a whole month of great cinema, including access to the amazing library for free. Sign up right now to start your cinematic journey with movie. We love it as much as Howard loves high stakes. This is me. This is my fucking way. This is how I win. I told you I'm walking. I got the man. I'm walking here. I'm walking here. So you will listen to every damn word I have to say. I can't call him right now. He's in practice. We're talking about practice, not a game, not a game, not a game. We talking about practice. Are you too good for your home? Answer me. Hey, the keys are in the trunk. Say that again. I said the keys are in here. Hark! Who goes there? Dayman. Ah, fighter of the night, man. Ah, champion of the sun. Ah, you're a master of karate and friendship for everyone. I see you in a big rush to, to come over here, huh? Really so you heard that I was in a car accident and then decided to stop off for some juji fruit? Listen to me. What's your name, sir? It's it's uh, anywhere from a thousand to three thousand dollars a carrot, and it's six hundred carats. Oh, that's over a million dollars. You don't actually think they spend twenty thousand dollars on a hammer, thirty thousand dollars on a toilet seat, do you? I want the Joker. From one professional to another. If you're trying to scare somebody, pick a better spot. From this height, fall wouldn't kill me. I'm counting on it.